Hey, greetings Minecrafters. That's how we always start out here. Um, I'm excited to have this video cast episode. And so let's get going. Uh, this is, I have with me my friend who I've talked about several times, more than a few times on these, on these uh, Minecraft uh, podcasts, Dr. Tom Myers. And we'll just, we'll just do a quickie what, what he's about. He's about a lot of things, a very interesting guy. Today we want to talk about spirituality and belonging and young adults. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. yeah. And and he and I will just throw this out there. He and I are gonna do a, a workshop on this coming up. So it's kind of like a little bit of a pre-workshop chat. Yeah, that's a great, great one. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think yeah, conversation today is kind of around the the idea of how spirituality connects with belonging mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. for young folks and and coming out of the pandemic, boy, that's oh my gosh, yes. sent everyone into a tailspin. The like, isolation, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I think a lot of young people then, with with this isolation, um, resort to social media mm -hmm. or resort to oh, for sure Netflix or anything on TV yeah, yeah, yeah. to kind of escape that. But certainly the the social media piece, and I don't know if it's. The FOMO peak, you know, right, 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 oh, I right. wish I were outside, I wish I were in the Caribbean, or I wish I were in, you know, somewhere in the Polynesian Islands. Or um, this other level of communication is that this misery loves company, where everyone is talking about how miserable they are on, on social media. And certainly we all we feel that. But sometimes you wonder, does that exacerbate more of it? You know, it's funny you say that, Tom. That. I know, it's funny. Tom and I have known each other now for a while. We've gotten wonderfully close talking about all these And we'll talk about our awesome workshops, too. Ta oh, what? Oh, I want to talk about our workshops, as well. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. But the, the Misery Loves Company yeah. thing, Tom, I've mentioned it on a few videos because it's such a, it's Misery Loves Company. Co misery Loves Company. It's really, in reality, Misery Loves Miserable Company, <laughs> right? The, the good vibes out there, the positive folks that are practicing positivity as part of their lifestyle, there's generally like sort of a force field that kind of pops mm -hmm. up with that. We're not as as interested. So what do you think about the draw to that and getting sucked in? Yeah, and the, kind of that, I wouldn't say schadenfreude, but the, you know, the, the revel, you know, the reveling in other people's misery. And I don't, but I think we're, we're all kind of feeling miserable. So the, the aspect of getting, I, I guess that might bring this up is like how you can go down that rabbit hole getting sucked. Oh, so easy, right? Sucked into it, like, oh. So gosh. easy. You know, there's another outbreak, or a new variation of COVID, you know, it's the Delta and, you know, whatever else is coming next. Like, oh my gosh. And I think the fact, <laughs> almost feeling out of it, you know, during the last summer when, okay, we're kind of coming out of it, and then the Delta, you know, mm -hmm. hits in the fall and just, everyone goes back. back. So, you know, and human beings are, you know, as we know, we're, we're social animals, and um, you know, the one kiss of death is in early, you know, human civilizations, the outcast from mm -hmm, the group. Mm -hmm. You know, essentially that equated to death. If you're not in a group, right, right, coming, right, right. gathering, you know, sharing in the rewards and sharing in the, you know, the the survival, um, you're outcast alone, and it really is a death sentence. So I think this feeling of not being in connection with others and in concert with others as we normally had been before right, the right, right. pandemic, and then you really feel alone. Um, it's just, it, it, it just does just detrimental stuff to the psyche, you know, because we crave this being together. Uh, I agree with you. Um, piece. The, I, I was just, uh, Tom, when you were saying that last bit there, it had me uh, thinking of Brene Brown's mm -hmm. work too. You know, she t she sort of defines. I know you're familiar with Brene's work too. Yeah. The how the fitting in and the belonging are different. How the, the fitting in thing, that need to fit in, is more kind of egoic and changing mm -hmm. who we are to match whatever. Versus that genuine sense of belonging, of actually authentically feeling like we're part of something. You know, what do you think about how that plays in yeah. social media, too, especially? Yeah, because social media mm -hmm. just can make us, that's 24 7. And right. Incessantly, it doesn't stop. You know, you can't, and again, you can 
when you're alone, what do you have? You have some, you know, technology. You have some, um, you know, cell phone data kind of following. So I think it's hard to escape that. And what um, I found very interesting is you know, some work done by. Um, it was, I love this book, which is called the, you know, the power of meaning. Yeah. yeah. And um, finding fulfillment in a in a world obsessed with happiness by Emily S. Bahani Smith. And we'll be using that in our mm -hmm. class as well. But she talked about one of the first of the four pillars and one of the first, not any order, but of the of belonging. And um, no matter who you are, you have some sense of belonging to a family or to a group mm -hmm. or to some sort of social um, connected group. And and in the in the book, she describes a story of this young man who was in a, um, a a group that was a small kind of a not a it was a medieval reenactment group, and um, and he had had some mental illness and didn't show up and contemplated suicide, and um, I think his cohort of friends, very tight small group of friends in this learned about this and what I think was telling was that how upset the group was that he would have abandoned them and he would have left this group and they were saying we would have been so sad obviously so sad because you're a vital part of our group right, when right. you feel you're right. not worth anything you have no your self-image is so low you don't realize the the panoramic you know, um, emanation of right, your, right, right. how you are to others and how valued you are. He really didn't know how valued he was to others, but it was really telling when they, you know, came back and said, "Oh my gosh, we would have been devastated if you had, you know, if you had followed through right, and right, right, successful right. in, a, in a suicide." So it just is interesting, kind of going both ways of how you feel individually as yourself and. Are you feeling like you contribute to other people's happiness and well-being? And I think we do a lot more than we realize. We probably tell ourselves we're not worth it. Right. Right. It right, isn't right, 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 right. I know would miss me anyway. Oh my gosh! But then you realize how important that is. Right. 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 To have that connection, and people do value you so much more than probably you value yourself. And they think it's a wonderful life, actually, and the Christmas isn't special. It? But I mean, I'm thinking actually, Tom, too, because. Uh, Tom and I uh, both uh, teach and have taught at Champlain here, and you know, cur currently across the country, as you're well aware, you know, depression and suicide mm -hmm. are just they're up there, you know. And so with our keep, like with the young adults, epidemic, yeah, epidemic, right. And so you know, th the depression all on its own is so far up there. And then, like you're saying, with the not realizing. You people you were so eloquent, so poetic with how you said that with you know basically how we touch so many lives yeah, yeah. that we don't understand. I I'm wonder I'm wondering, Tom, you're a scuba diver too, right? So I'm wondering sometimes when when do you think when this when the young adult gets in the throes of that depression, it's kind of like um, when a scuba diver dives too fast down too deeply, they get the bends, the bends. Other way around. Is it the way around? Yeah. When they come up. But if you go down too quickly, obviously your your head's <laughs> You're going to get the squeeze. And it's going right, to be but isn't it painful. like, tell me if this is correct, because you're the expert on it, it um, that they, they get so disoriented they have to blow bubbles, you know, which way yeah, is up? Yeah, so you, the vertigo, you can, you can, you can get um, turned upside down so you don't know what is up, what's the surface, and right. what's the, so if you blow, you watch your bubbles. That's how you know what's going on. bubbles are going down, I mean, you're upside down. You're upside down. So you're watching the bubbles, obviously, surface. So it gives you an idea of where, so it's you know, where it orients. Yeah. So the disorientation um, and the vertigo, where you just totally lose, you have no spatial relation, you have no reference. Right. And, the, you know, and you're kind of in an inner, inner space in the water. So you have to watch where the bubbles. Watch. So you don't know which, end of, which way is up. You yeah. have to watch the bubbles. Yeah. So I'm wondering, Tom, with being in the throes of depression, if this is a really sort of a metaphor. Mm. When people get, like, because you're saying, you don't, I don't know how valued I am. And because sometimes people will judge each other so selfish after they've done that. They're not selfish. They don't know which way is up. Right. You know yes. what I'm saying? So I thought that might be a metaphor that works here, kind of. That people, it's not a vertigo issue, but it's an emotional vertigo, you know? Yeah. 
out of whack, out of balance, don't, can't see what's, I'm not clear about my value. And I love the metaphor of oxygen bubbles, no matter how small right. they are, but they can, you know, they, they can um, emanate out. And again, however small you feel and however small your impact you feel is, right, right. Or how small it's going to be seen and affected by, by others. Well, I like um, that. Yeah, I think that's a nice, and that's a really good point, Kim, because like, you don't realize what is it, what is that telltale sign that, that people can give to uh, others um, in that they, that, 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 that can be this signal that um, they need help, but in a signal in a way that you are create, you're showing your value. I think you're, with one way that those bubbles could be is service to others. And, 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 and in a way that you're giving to others somehow. And um, I think that's one of the areas that can help with feeling lonely or feeling depressed and, and Again, I'm oversimplifying. Right, right, right. But that's but so you Gandhi. You see though. a way that you yeah, know, yeah. just your little bit of mm -hmm. yourself you're giving out to others, um, and then that response of how that's received and given back. Right. I think it's exponential. You can give a little, and I think oh, no question. So that you know, that can come back to you. spiritually speaking. I'm just I'm totally paraphrasing Gandhi to the hill here, mm -hmm. but and didn't he say something about? Also for the person who's feeling blue, uh, that and not to simplify, it's obviously more complicated than this, but we get so stuck in our heads when we do something good for someone else, it also pulls us out. And God used to say, if you're feeling, you know, blue, again, there's a whole spectrum of that, right? Um, then it can actually help the person who's not feeling valuable to feel better. Mm. Yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah. Helping other people and service to other other things or other people, you know, even if it's helping, again, nice other people but helping the environment or somehow that you are assisting and supporting um, something you believe in. But yeah, it, it is it is to the connection with people and belonging and service and offer to others. It does. It's it's. Do you think people overthink it too much and think, oh no, my service has to be huge? I have to make like the Peace Corps or something. Yeah. No. I mean, yeah, I think they do overthink it. In Help somebody carry groceries. Exactly, yeah. Eight months pregnant. Yeah. You yeah. know, just, just offer. Maybe she's fine, but just offer. Yeah, I'm always amazed at just holding the door open. Right. For someone, like carrying bags or carrying, you know, hey, I got this for you. Oh, thank you so much. And I wonder if there's a, a need to return to the feeling of. Or the, the service, say, yeah. yeah, to others. Yeah. And one of the classes I taught was called Purpose, Meaning, and Happiness. And and I think students started to feel as though, oh, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to learn to be happy. And that is the, again, happiness is at the end. But um, it, that I'm going to take this class and I'm going to be happy. Right. And, and we understand that happiness is fleeting. You're not. 100% happy all the time, 24-7, right, right. right? Comes and goes, but what it, happiness is a byproduct of that purpose and meaning. Oh, definitely, way. yeah. And I found that students throughout the semester realized, oh my gosh, it's the little things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When one student wrote about a woman who dropped her groceries in the store and she helped pick them, you know, help, help them to pick them up and how good that helped her to feel. Just a minor little piece. But I think um, progressively and, and cumulatively, as that builds more service to others, that it can give that sense of well-being and a sense of, of happiness. Oh, totally. That's back to that belonging and connection. The belonging connection. Yeah. So I think, I'm also thinking what comes to mind right now is, is that Seligman's the good life, right? Mm. The, you know, pleasure's here. We're not saying don't have a good burger, you know, whatever, because we need that too. And then, uh, of course, the flow. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the meaningful is the most long-lasting, like, just like you're saying, the longest-lasting good feeling that there really can be. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so the belonging piece, how do you think, 
the belonging piece can maybe stave off, even prevent depression. Um, yeah, and it's it can obviously be True really belonging. hard. Yeah, when the levels of depression and mental illness, where you you just cannot be with other people, or don't want to be with other people, and obviously it's sometimes easier said than done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I think it, it, having this circle of belonging where people are a little bit are are tied into how you're feeling and connect and you know where your state of mind is. And I think that's having you know friends or having family that can be connected um, with you. But I think the isolation piece again back to the pandemic mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. forced everyone to be. Um, really, really was, was incredibly difficult. And you know, coming out of that now, I think we learned a lot about you know, the continuing to be connected. But yeah, I think it's... Um, well, the isolation and, you know, the, speaking of epidemics, I don't know if we talking about the pandemics, but epidemics, the loneliness thing. I was reading not too long ago that loneliness, at least in the, the United States anyway, has been bumped right up with um, obesity sm and smoking for leading causes of death yeah. with heart, heart disease. Like loneliness is actually up there with smoking and all the heart disease stuff. I mean, that's wild to me. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, the Surgeon General, Vet Markey, who um, was under the Obama administration and brought back under the, the Biden administration, when he took the role as Surgeon General, he went out across the United States and he wanted to to get a, a kind of a handle on what was going on out there mm -hmm. what what are the issues and he fully expected it to be the opioid crisis right which obviously right. is huge obviously it's a major major thing but what he found it wasn't it was that but more so was the the loneliness piece um and the feeling of, of people feeling lonely and one thing he said that really struck me and this is a lot with men and, and obviously men went across the United States, but he was referring to one part about men and that if a guy wakes up in the middle of the night, 3.30 in the morning, you know, that very few have that one friend that they could call if they're right. in a crisis. Right, right, right. You know, and that was, I thought, the Surgeon General uh, Murthy just thought that was really telling. Um, in that you don't have a go-to person, you know, when, when you're in need. But yeah, you're in, you go you know, look at the level of um, maladies and sickness and illness that being the sense of loneliness that, that can... Um, it's a kill. Uh, yeah. It's actually a kill. I'm thinking of, um, just watch the timer, because we're going to do another sequel, we're going to do another little okay. segment too. Um, it has me thinking of that famous Harvard study, yeah. the longitudinal one, yeah, right? The longest so they, in history. The longest yes. in history. Yes. Yep. And basically, the, the bullets and bold of that study were just what you're saying was it's that number one. Um, to have, well, to have one person, you're, you're pretty set. But if you have two or three of those, you're really golden. Yeah. Where you can wake them up at three o'clock in the morning, and they can also wake you up at three o'clock in the morning. You might need to get oriented for a cup of, a cup of tea or something. Yeah. But and that they wouldn't also that they they expand it a little bit I think where they, you you could tell them kind of let them in your rib cage tell them what's cracking your heart down the middle mm -hmm. knowing that that information is safe that you're you know that it's it's confidential you're not going to say anything and that you could count on them no matter what yeah. and even just one of those people and I don't forget, I forget the stats too but the longevity goes up like miles yeah. and they, he also said the 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 man I'm thinking of I think he was the second to, I don't know which researcher is, but he's towards now, sort of current. Um, he said that there, that's, it's not just, it's a quality, not quantity of relationships, right? Yeah. So staying in yes. a marriage when it's toxic has a reverse effect. It's those positive, we're not, not saying perfect either, positive people that you can count on no matter what. Yeah, Yeah, and that being the common denominator for longevity is having this yes. circle of friends or circle of relate, you know, as you say, quality relationships. Yeah, more important than not eating Twinkies. 
<laughs> True. Oh, three because you're good, right? Yeah. yeah. And balance, you need moderation, right? Balance, right? Balance. And so, uh, so I think um, Tom and I are actually going to continue our discussion. So we'll go ahead and, and sign off for right now. Okay. Be, be right back. Be right back.